Ladies and gentlemen, moving ahead <laughs> with the inaugural plenary uh, based on the topic of public policy design, implementation and analysis, I would like to invite the esteemed panelists to take a seat on the stage. Coming first, Dr. Arushi Jain, Policy Director, Bharti Institute of Public Policy, Indian School of Business. Mr. Amarjeet Sinha, former advisor to the Prime Minister. Mr. Jugal Kishore Mohapatra, former Chief Secretary, Government of Odisha. Mr. K. Srinivas, Director, Lal Bahadur Shastri, National Academy of Administration. Thank you so much uh, for this learned panel to be here. Uh, truly a pleasure to moderate uh, this particular session. Uh, so, um, going by uh, the timing, uh, we will keep it to uh, some initial question where I'll request uh, our guests to speak for around 10 minutes and then a few more questions. After that, we'll also open it up to the audience here to ask uh, their uh, you know, queries, ask their questions to our esteemed panel today. So as we all know, uh, public policy is a process and not a product. Uh, policy is very important. Uh, there are successes that we see, but there are also a lot of challenges that come along with that. Uh, the entire uh, topic today of public policy design, implementation and analysis is uh, very imperative as an aspect. And, uh, uh, coming to the same, you know, my first question uh, on this panel is to uh, Mr. Jugal uh, Mahapatra, uh, who has been uh, the former Chief Secretary of Orissa. He was the pioneer of many flagship schemes, including uh, the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Act, the Prime Minister's uh, Sadak Yojana, um, so, you know, Gram Sadak Yojana, uh, and similarly many others. Uh, so, Mr. Mohapatra, my question to you would be, how do you think, uh, you know, public policy design is very important in this entire uh, aspect? And do you think design is more important or the implementation part of it? And how do you weigh both of them? Thank you. Uh, is it working? Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, not prepared to be the opening batsman <laughs> on a bouncy pitch. Uh, but nevertheless, I think uh, we have had a very uh, energizing uh, speech from uh, Navika Kumarji, and uh, he has challenged us in many respects. Uh, the first thing uh, about public policy, and uh, most of us, our combined experience is more than 100 years. <laughs> so, so one thing uh, without fear of being contradiction, uh, any contradiction, I might say that uh, very often the design issues have received much less attention than the implementation issues. Uh, had we thought through the design issues much more uh, intensively, perhaps uh, the program outcomes delivery would have been much better. And that's something that learning has filtered through uh, right across whether you look at center, whether you look at states, whether you look at local governments. But that said, I think uh, there are issues uh, why uh, you know, uh, design issues are extremely complex in a country like India. And uh, to start with, let me, your uh, theme is bridging uh, the uh, research and practice. Um, I remember one of our professors, my teachers, used to say that these are two, it's like a dialogue between the deaf. So uh, we don't listen to each other. So that is the first thing that needs to be emphasized. And this professor used to say that uh, part of the reason why India has struggled through a Hindu rate of growth is precisely because just as Indian economy is growth proof, Indian uh, civil service is knowledge proof. Uh, with due respect uh, to all my colleagues, and, uh, you know, in a lighter than he used to say, but there is a large element of truth in that. We have, uh, for a long period, and, and this is, this is not uh, remains uh, unchanged over the years, it has been changing very happily. Uh, when we do craft a policy, rarely we look, look at research and evidence. Uh, something has been articulated by somebody, 
and we start weaving a policy around it. We don't look at whether uh, a similar policy uh, has been implemented elsewhere, how has it worked, uh, what were the issues, uh, can they, were they, did they deliver the expected outcomes. These are things that we really look at. Uh, to, I mean, I just let me narrate a recent experience. Recently, you would have heard that the Rajasthan government has come out with an urban wage employment guarantee scheme. And I was requested by somebody to write a piece on that. The first thing I wanted to look at is how much of uh, you know, previous experience has been factored in uh, while crafting this policy. Uh, many of you, some of you might remember, many of you might not. Earlier, we had a Swan Jayanti Sehri Rozgar Yojana in Government of India. It worked from 2000, uh, for about 10 years or more. And the, it had a wage employment program for the urban areas. What happened to that program? I started looking at research, any evaluation research. You won't find anything. So the, when the program was wound up in 2012, it was given a decent burial, and uh, that was the end of it. What, why did it fail? Why, did, why didn't it uh, work uh, effect, as effectively it, uh, it should have? Is not. And therefore, not surprising that Rajasthan government was clueless or blissfully unaware of what, uh, what, what, what went right and what went wrong with that kind of thing. So I think one of the things that possibly for the first learning is look at what has worked and what has not worked purely in terms of evidence and, uh, and not, not purely, but at least in terms of evidence and, look, and try and see uh, how we can improve on that. And that's something that I, I need to emphasize. Uh, I think the important uh, the, I mean, the challenge, of course, in a country like India is far more daunting because we have vast diversity not only in terms of geography, but also in terms of social structure, social practices, economic systems, land systems. So what might work in, in, in a typical um, you know, Central Indian state or a West, Western Indian state uh, might not work in Northeast because where land is communally owned. There are lots of other issues. So I think when we look at these things, things become very, very difficult. The other uh, thing uh, is, uh, you know, ideally, you should roll out a policy by designing some kind of pilot. Uh, ideally, you should roll it out as a pilot. And if you, I mean, even a questionnaire, we pre-test the questionnaire before even uh, finalizing the questionnaire. But in a large-scale program, which come where we are like expected to commit one lakh crore of rupees in a budget outlay, we don't even do a small pilot to see how we can design it better. So. That is something, uh, have, if we try and look, uh, you know, roll it out and do a pilot, perhaps something uh, much better outcomes might come. But that's, uh, I mean, very uh, normally, you know, uh, people come out with, ye to program karna hai. You know, it can't be limited to, uh, five, uh, to 30 blocks or uh, 30 districts. It has to be roll, rolled out all over the country. So I think, uh, perhaps, in my view, uh, rolling out small pilots uh, to gain some experience would be very, very important, very, very useful. The third thing, uh, I mean, in economics, all of you possibly know that the first bet, best is really available to us. In the ideal environment, you, you follow the marginal cost principle, and that works. The ideal world is far different. It has too many constraints. Uh, we don't. Uh, we always look for the second or third best solutions, and therefore, it is important to even uh, factor that in. That there are the ideal thing is not uh, always uh, achievable. Look at GST. Wonderful, uh, I think, accomplishment for an uh, Indian federal system, where so many states have relinquished their taxation power. The m m almost the only taxation power the state said. The central government has also given up its major source of uh, taxation flexibility, and they have come together to craft a policy normally uh, you know, called the one nation, one tax policy. But we had to make too many compromises because there are too many people, stakeholders had a, had a say in that. Somebody says, Kendulip, kuch hordo, koi aage kahe kahega wo, 
ने हमारे वहाँ हैंडलूम है उसको छोड़ना पड़ेगा देन पीपल से आर अच्छा वो यू नो दैट शूज ऑफ सर्टन वैल्यू विल हैव शुड हैव लेसर रेट्स ऑफ रेट्स ऑफ टैक्सेशन सो द आइडियल पॉलिसी ऑफ ए सिंगल रेट रेवेन्यू न्यूट्रल रेट डजेंट विच आइडियली एवरी इकोनॉमिक विल टेल यू कैन नॉट डज वर्क वी डू हैव टू मेक कंप्रोमाइज एंड एज वी ट्रेवल्स अलॉन्ग द वे we should calibrate it and try and bring people uh, on this thing so the median policy should should be this thing so i think the compromises that we need to make also make at times the design extremely complex uh, that's something that uh, needs to be emphasized uh, finally i think i mean uh, let me say a few things let me not uh, take a lot of time my colleagues will uh, this thing uh, there is a very old principle rule that uh, many of you students of public policy possibly know uh, many uh, others uh, the one of the, the first uh, nobel prize uh, winner in economics zan tinbergen he had uh, done a lot of work on policy making and uh, his golden rule is uh, if you have n policy targets you must have at least n instruments so tying each policy with one instrument is possibly absolutely unavoidable but we try to violate that rule every now and then we try to achieve several things several targets with one instrument uh, and a good uh, you know example is both of us have, can be blamed for it to some extent so then can also be blamed for it narega is an ideal example of that thing we try to do too many things one with one policy i think uh, a greater focus uh, a more focused policy to achieve some targeted outcome works better i mean a good uh, the uh, the contrast is the pradhan mantri gram sadak yojana or even the 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 prime minister awas yojana where the program is simply designed okay here is the program that will build good rural roads or build good rural houses for the uh, poor simple programs simple uh, you know one pol one target one policy it works better when you have plethora of objectives humko uh, we have to provide again full employment we have to create productive assets we have to have gender uh, gender lens also we have to have strengthening of panchayats uh, and, and we have to have we have to fight climate change all this becomes extremely difficult so i think uh, one of the lessons that i would like to share is that let's try and craft simple policies for simple targets much much work much better and finally let me also uh, i mean say one more thing uh, make things simple there is nothing uh, that is a that is a mantra that one can an implementation uh, of a program or a project or a or a policy becomes much better if it is simple if we try to complete complicate it and which is what our core competency is often uh, so it becomes extremely difficult we we design okay koi program ke liye ek application bharna hai to main khud nahi bhar paunga but we expect the beneficiaries to uh, to fill it up so i think simple programs uh, uh, simple uh, making things simple works very much better take the case of the plastic ban almost everywhere we we have banned single use plastic why doesn't it work have we provided cost effective alternatives right at the place where it should be Uh, used the small vendor who basically relies on the the single use plastic to for his uh, daily uh, livelihood what recourse does he have if you ban it and do we have the capacity to enforce it so i think these are some of the preliminary issues i would like to flag and then maybe we'll join uh, the list is can be added stick and my two colleagues are much better place than i am i have become very dated thank you so much thank you so much mr bhavapatra for talking about the challenges also the kind of solutions uh, from a policy design perspective uh, next i'll go to mr amarjit sinha uh, the last book of his uh, an india for everyone a path to inclusive development uh, was uh, you know one uh, that talked about uh, the development of the country and what could be done but i think he further moved on and is uh, coming up with another new book talking about the last mile delivery uh, so my question to you mr sinha with your experience from the sarv uh, shiksha abhiyan as well as the national rural health mission and all others that you have uh, you know led with your uh, with your competence uh, is that what are the critical factors uh, for success of any uh, public policy and what is the way forward for that <coughs> Uh, 
गुड मॉर्निंग फ्रेंड्स एम आई ऑडिबल या फ्रेंड्स इट्स अ प्लेजर टू बी हियर एंड अ वेरी हैप्पी न्यू ईयर वी आर ऑल बिगिनिंग विद न्यू होप्स इन अ न्यू ईयर एंड इट्स अ गुड टाइम टू टॉक अबाउट द रिलेशनशिप ऑफ पॉलिसी मेकिंग एंड रिसर्च बिकॉज क्लियरली दिस इज वन एरिया वेयर अनफॉर्चुनेटली दोज हु डू do not write and those who write do not do and this shows up in a lot of what happens here as was being remarked a little earlier one of the objectives of the indian school of business was to promote research as well i think you were mentioning it in the morning because the indian institutes of management many of them which came up while all of them had agendas of research but for some reason or the other lot of their research remained confined to how hindustan lever can sell mole soaps it did not really cover large areas of public policy if you go to uk the national health scheme that they have the nhs the best of universities of uk study nhs to tell you if something can be done on the waiting time to tell you how can the customer satisfaction be better and so on unfortunately in our country we did not develop a rich tradition of research looking at public policy carefully through evidence now this is a gap because you know in my present book that i was trying to work on the biggest challenge you face is good empirical evidence based work to build on now in this context can since you mentioned about how policies are formulated many a time i see young minds here you must be wondering how governments formulate policies do they do it in a locked room do they do it without consulting anybody do they make compromises on the way how do they do it since your question is specific to that let me narrate three very different journeys all equally interesting the first is with regard to the sarva shiksha abhiyan the universal elementary education as many of you would know 42nd round nsso 1986-87 not 47 86-87 six plus females in rural india never enrolled in a school we must have done something really wrong in the first four decades for having neglected primary education and primary health having said that now when you look at the constitution education health nutrition do not figure in the fundamental rights they figure in the directive principles of state policy i am giving this context because the debate on education happened differently from the debate on health in the case of education again this is what judicial activism can do justice bp jeevan reddy was hearing a matter with regard to capitation fee in higher education institutions the unni krishnan judgment 1992 while examining the issues with regard to capitation fee in higher education institutions that bench majority judgment said education of children up to the age of 14 years mark my words the judgment says up to the age of 14 years should be a fundamental right this was like many judicial pronouncements people thought ye bhi aayega ye bhi chala jayega you know the orders will come but you know compliance can always be done on paper nobody is going to follow it up there after what happens a couple of years went by not much was happening a 78 year old a lawyer in jabalpur high court satyapal anand suddenly gets up in court one day and said unni krishnan judgment just read these orders this is declared as a fundamental right what are the states doing that matter comes up to the supreme court further deliberations the judges when there was a lot of pressure from civil society and from such uh, you know old people but with very very tenacious people who wanted it done people like satyapal anand the supreme court sets up a appoints the, the then solicitor general ard arjunya as the amicus curiae and directs every chief secretary of a state to file an affidavit before the supreme court where eight areas of energization were identified is there a school within 1 km and so on classrooms 
whatever. Every chief secretary had to swear an affidavit in the Supreme Court what they are doing and what they will do over the next couple of years. Because of a judicial policy was evolving, because the judiciary was active. Then we come to the next stage, when this whole process goes on, government also decides, Mr. Bomai was the HRD minister, why don't we set up a, a committee of all education ministers of the country? Under the Minister of State at that time, Mr. Muhiram Saikia from Assam. So 1992 was the judgment. 1995, finally, after all the pressure, 95-96, the Muhiram Saikia Committee of All Education Ministers of India gets set up to find out the resource need for universal elementary education. It does a mathematical calculation. 8 crore children out of school, 500 per child per year, additional financial requirements of 40,000 crores over 5 years. It also says that, but this is a ballpark figure. There should be a normative exercise, because the compliance the Supreme Court is asking for is a substantive one. So it suggested formula, forming of another committee. 95-96, Muhiram report comes in 97, the Tapas Majumdar Committee, which was originally the Vaidyanath Ayer Committee, is formed. Tapas Majumdar was Amartya Sen's teacher, Professor Emeritus at JNU, he is no more. Now, Tapas Majumdar, and I had the privilege of being his member secretary for a good two years that we worked on the report. Now, each and now, here you have academic inputs coming into public policy. They come up with a report which says financial resource needs for UE on a normative basis. They argue that a teacher is needed for 30 children, not for 40. The policy may have said 40, and things of this kind. So naturally the figure was much more than the 40,000 crores that the Muhiram Saikia committee had asked for. It was 1,36,842 crores. By then the government had changed. Mr. Vajpayee was the Prime Minister, Yashwan Sinha was the Finance Minister, Advani ji Home Minister and so on. Jaitli Saab was the Law Minister. Very, you know, with a lot of confidence that we have an expert group now behind us, we moved the cabinet with that proposal, 1,36,842 crores. Additional resource over the next 10 years. Mr. Yashwan Sinha threw up his hands. Where is this money going to come from? Ye paisa kahan se aega? We don't have so much money. So policy making is not purist. Democracy is there's a certain game going on between leaders, resources, and demands. So what happens? A, a committee of ministers gets set up. Nine ministers with Dr. Murli Manohar Joshi as a chairperson, whose mandate basically was to tone down the Tapas Majumda recommendations a little bit. Instead of 1 is to 30, make it 1 is to 40, and so on. So it came to still about 60,000 crores. Now, with this exercise, when we went to the cabinet again, again, uh, the finance minister gets up to say, but where will this money come from? But we had an extremely, extremely, you know, uh, sensitive prime minister in Mr. Atal Bihari Vajpayee. His response in the cabinet was, Bacho ka mamla hai chalne do. And that's how the Sarva Shiksha Abhiyan got approved. Now, so public policy formulation can take different routes. In the case of the health mission, very interestingly, in the case of health mission, there was a Supreme Court ruling of health as a fundamental right. The <coughs> Majdur Union versus the government of West Bengal, Supreme Court had ruled that it's a fundamental right, but nobody pursued it. So it didn't come from the rights framework. In the case of health, primary health, it came because the then Prime Minister, Dr. Manmohan Singh, when he was not a Prime Minister and out of power, he went and lived in Geneva for some years, with an organization which was doing development. And among other subjects that he studied there was health. So when he came to power, the one of the first things we got to know was he wants a health mission now, just like Sarva Shiksha Abhiyan came up with the previous NDA government. And across governments, these have continuities. So that is how the process of the health mission started. This time, the route was different. The formulation, because the Prime Minister himself had done a detailed study on health, he had some notions on where and what he wanted us to do. But policy making was not coming from a court of law. So what we had to do was, in fact, uh, again, a person who is no more, Dr. Mr. R. Gopalakrishna, a civil servant who was additional secretary to the Prime Minister. I was outside government at that time with the UK government as an education advisor. 
we were told that you please now we have to get some formulations done. Ten committees were set up with the top names that you can think of from the Devi Shettys, from the Trehans, all of them. Somebody on a health financing committee, somebody on a primary health committee, somebody on preventive health, Abhay Bang, all of them. The top practitioners, academics, drawn from different institutions, in ten different committees, Rama Baru, all of them. They were asked to examine the issues of that particular thing, ten themes. What came as their report, the task fell on our team to bring that together in a framework for implementation for the National Rural Health Mission. So in a way, consultation with the experts happened on a large scale. Now again, these happen, the media is also very much party to it. And, and it's important in public policy. I still recall when the large scale consultation with state governments and others was happening. For Sarva Shiksha Abhiyan, SSA, in, after one of the consultations, one of the headlines read, SSA, making an ass of people, reversing the, saying that old wine in new bottle, ye bahut pehle so hai. education. So you have to be prepared for bouquets and brick bats both. It's a different matter that an initiative of the NDA government continued in the UPA government. Similarly, the health mission and initiative of the UPA government continued in the NDA government. So public policy, if it is formulated on evidence, based drawing the best of from all minds has a legal backing because of honorable courts intervening it makes a difference so similarly the third example from the housing the pradhan mantri avas yojana sir and i we had the occasion to work on it when the pradhan mantri avas yojana gramin was being developed what was our starting point the performance audit of the cag controller and auditor general castigating report on the Indra Avas Yojana on what went wrong with it. So policy can begin with such documents as well. In fact, that's always the best way to begin, to understand what did not work and take care of that in your policy. It said that from Kashmir to Kanyakumari, houses look identical. It said that the space is inadequate. It said many other things. So what became our starting point, if these were the challenges, we got the Institute of Planning and Architecture, we got the IIT Delhi and others, to go around the whole country, their good faculty to go around the whole country, look at designs of housing. And in that traditional design frame, how to make it flood proof, how to make it wind proof, how to make it seismic proof, let the broad design be the same. This exercise was carried out and altogether more than 257 designs from across the country for different zones was identified. And then we sat down to do the calculations. When we started doing the calculations, it came out that this house cannot happen in less than 1.5 lakhs. Now the problem is that the earlier house was being done at for 75,000. If we are going to ask for 1.5 lakhs, there will be questions, ki, itna paisa kahan se aega? Because by then the socio-economic census had also been released and we needed to do almost 2.95 crore houses to provide a house to all. The we realized that the amounts are going to be large, so public policy again had to curb because of financial resource needs. But we said nothing less than 1.5 lakhs. 12,000 will give for the toilet from Swachh Bharat Mission, 18,000 for 90, uh, 90 days of work under MGNREGS, rest of it from. But when all this was done, 1.5 lakhs, and we prepared our cabinet notes accordingly, very sure that we've done our homework very thoroughly, the designs have been studied, nobody is going to say anything. Suddenly we get a call which said, no, 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 no. You bring it down to 1 lakh, not 1.5 lakh. So here is a case where the first cabinet note said 1.5 lakhs. The first supplementary note said 1 lakh. But then we made our faces and we protested that we do not accept this. We do not think it is the right thing to do. If we really want to give dignity to the poor, nothing less than 1.5 lakhs. And at times your prayers work. In public policy, even your prayers work. And our prayers worked, and sirs, uh, you know, following up continuously helped. We, got, we were told, no, 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 restore your 1.5 lakh. It's a matter of record, there are three cabinet notes. There's a note saying 1.5 lakh, there's an additional note saying, no, we'll do it in 1 lakh, and a third one restoring it to 1.5 lakhs. So a lot of the processes in public policy, these are all touch and go. How much are the, of the evidence are you willing to stick by? 
can you tell those who want to design you to design a program ki it is not possible rather than saying ki ho jayega pragmatism must have a boundary line otherwise we say yes to yes infrastructure yes now the fate of narega has become what it is you want to start a tanks program narega will do it you want to do uh, life mission narega will do it everything narega is doing so as a consequence narega doesn't know what it is designed for is it poverty reduction is it infrastructure now that's a uh, uh, the government has set up a committee i am chairing that committee and we are here for that <laughs> it's a, you know it's like catching a live mouse a fish yahan se pakadon lagta hai ki you have handled poverty then you realize you no know, it's about asset making so public policy is you no know, the you nobody gets a green field we all get brown fields but many a time as students we feel that we are getting a green field sorry for i have taken long time but i wanted to explain the process thank you so much mr sinha this was a truly amazing such lovely stories and stories that no one of us would have ever got to know if we don't hear it from people like you uh next and uh, next we go to mr kesri nevas um <laughs> not written <laughs> yes yes i agree <laughs> so mr k srinivas uh, uh, was uh, the establishment officer at uh, the dopt before uh, labasna for a long time he has been involved with the capacity building uh, initiatives uh, for civil servants in india along with that he has also uh, been uh, you know in leading a lot of initiatives uh, pro at the project implementation uh, part so my question to you would be that uh, how can uh, we look at effectively implementing policies and initiatives and how does capacity building uh, play a role in this effective implementation uh, especially uh, because there are uh, lots of uh, new things that labasna is taking up for civil servant training across the country <laughs> uh thank you arushi ji and uh, i think uh, i follow a very beautifully laid out field where uh, both my predecessors and eminent uh, senior civil servants have explained how the large policy formats happen in fact uh, you'll also notice a distinct difference here there's a, a diversity on this stage mr sinha comes from another cadre bihar sir comes from orissa i come from gujarat three different administrative traditions so from that perspective i'd like to do something counter intuitive how would gujarat do it i mean how do we do things differently and i will speak a little bit about a uh, little bit about design and little bit about the implementation of course go on to what you asked me to do in terms of capacity having served in gujarat for about 33 years and having dealt with a range of public policy implementation project implementation lot of things i think we also need to sharply define what do we mean by public policy and its intervention not everything is massive national 25 years it could be you know something like massive legislation right to food would be a massive legislative intervention but a project which would say that we will want to take up this particular district from a level to b level is a project to a level intervention a small programmatic improvement the kind of things but we might as public policy policy professionals try get to engage in is a different game so the complexity does not exist every time so i think when we start dealing with the entire idea of what are we talking about so we should understand what is the scale we are talking of what is the level that we are addressing are we talking of a large policy are we talking about a program are we talking about a project are we talking about a task that is the first now gujarat has a different way of doing and I had the opportunity of delivering some very innovative programs uh, and in this sense it is very inductive logic rather than the deductive logic look at large data sets and then start reducing what can we do what can be the intervention for example i'll give you an example of the gujarat earthquake rehabilitation program i was managing director of uh, the gujarat urban development company 
And at that point, I was tasked with rebuilding 14 cities that were completely demolished and de destroyed by the earthquake. Dr. P.K. Mishra was the policy chair head in the GSDMA. I was the operational side. No, we did several things. The Gujarat has three, four important attributes we should know, recognize, and try to replicate in other parts of the country. Number one, the state is extremely entrepreneurial. So how do you make societies become entrepreneurial in order to have successful public policies, I think, is an important element of every policy design. So when you're designing itself, you need to figure out what is the nature of your citizenry, of your clientele, what is the level of enterprise, and how much can they absorb? So the first is second, is, is the level of enterprise. Second is that it is extraordinarily participative. There's a huge degree of participative action. So you're hearing the grassroots very carefully. There's a lot of local information that is coming up. So this participative nature, so again, induction logic that I'm talking about, starting from the bottom. Third is there's a huge degree of deliberation that happens at that level, which is extremely important in formulation of a successful policy. And fourth, how do you make it a part of, as Honorable PM constantly says, he would use a beautiful Hindi word, he'll say, make it sahaj, make it a normal process normal social activity. Don't think of policy work or government intervention as something that is happening outside of your, of your normal routine and it is office work. How do you make it a part of a social movement? So coming to GERRP, when we were doing this entire reconstruction program, we rebuilt the 14 cities, but the purpose was not only to rebuild the 14 cities. It was economic regeneration, it was social regeneration, and building new models of regional and supra-regional development. And if I tell you without exaggeration, today the Smart Cities program of the Government of India is a direct output coming from that single program. Now, sir spoke about a pilot case. It was a pilot case, if you may say it, because we invested at that point in time 573 crores. But the learnings that came out of that became a part of policy, validated, and each of these principles first got adapted in the Gift City project, which was another of the projects that I led. And the Gift City project became the template for the Smart Cities program. So the point I'm trying to make is it is not as if every time some top-down type of a thing happens. Second example, there is a, there is a city, small city called Drangadra in Saurashtra. Some of you who might be from that region would be aware. Now, Drangadra used to be, uh, it's, a, it's a very different place, very close to the little run of Kutch. And we had a huge incidence of female infanticide. And female infant infanticide was happening in a very particularly specific community because of the social structure of that community. The Rajputs, there was a category of Rajputs called Jadejas. Amongst them, invariably 99.99% they would be female inf infanticide because they had this very funny fetish that they are the most superior and therefore would not want to give out their daughter in marriage to anybody else and all these strange things that happen in our society and therefore they had this traditional problem where female infanticide was happening so program was started in 2006 as a social mobilization campaign it started on scooters led by the Honorable Prime Minister and some of his associates, Mr. Mr. I. K. Jadeja and few other people, they all started initially, I remember, on about 250 scooters, going from house to house, creating a campaign of awareness. Okay, today it is a national program. So a lot of, a lot of in, in incentive, inspiration for programs do not necessarily come from data. They can come from social movements and social realization. Third, another example, and I was party to that initial first campaign that happened, which is you know, addressing the same thing about what is the enrollment rate in primary schools. So there was a very interesting experiment that used to be carried out in a small village in Sanan, where all the children would be mobilized around the 1st of June, 
they'd be brought as if it is in a celebration, and all of them would be nicely decorated. They they'll wear their all these you know party caps, and then they would be brought as if they are participating in a festival. It used to be called Rishala Praveshotsav. And I remember doing the first one, I was collector in Ahmedabad. Mrs. Anandi Ben Patel was the health minister, education minister, currently governor. The first bullock cart I remember bringing with about 15 children. Today it's a national program. With all the impacts that, which has resulted in changing the, the adverse kind of data that we see at the national level. The point I'm trying to make is there's a lot of inductive logic that happens. Please do not discount it and ensure that the social conditions are right, which brings me to the next issue. When you're designing a, pro a policy or a project or a program, please think about the implementation first. How are you going to implement it? A policy that is not designed for implementation is doomed to failure. We have designed it to fail. If we are careful about the implementation issues, well, what are the, some of the big issues today? What is the implementer versus supervisor ratio in the country? It is an inverted pyramid. For every person who is working, there are 10 supervisors. That's a fact. Please bear me out. For every one person in the taluka or a village level, there are 10 people who are supervising him, 15 people collecting data, another 25 people researching on that data. I don't, don't want to disparage because I'm a part of the same community. But if you go and see, you'll find that there's no, the bottom is completely hollowed out. So therefore, we have to see what are the implementation issues. Here, I would like to look at a small project kind of an intervention. How can a project result in, in social progress and growth? I was tasked to implement the Statue of Unity, 2009. For about one year, we discussed. We debated not less than nine to ten times. At that time, um, he was the chief minister. We, decide, we debated what kind of a project should we have. Should it be a statue? Came much later. What should be the nature of the commemoration of the memory of Sadar Patel? What is the social context? What is the developmental context? And what is the output? What is the impact of this particular pro project? in its wider ramifications, was debated for at least one year. And then it was decided that, yes, we will have a statue because then we designed an entire new program called Icon-Based Developmental Model of Growth. We said, if you have an icon which can attract the attention of the world and place it at that time in the most backward portions of Gujarat and then bring in the entrepreneurial talent, bring in the, the potential of a lot of creative investment that, has happened, that can happen, it can transform. So today, you will not believe, even today, if, um, I hope some of you have gone to see the statue, which we have completed. In fact, the statue was designed for completion in 48 months. We did it in 34 months. Because we took three years to design it. We took three years designing every element every aspect of it with the result actually when the tender was issued in the final tender it was 1200 crores below our estimate that was the amount of saving we made because it was carefully constructed all risk was taken care of the, the person who was taking the task on knew that he was risk insured so therefore all the advantage came but then more than that is what is happening now surrounding this entire icon is close to around two and a half, three billion dollar of investment happening. What was the uh, most backward part of Gujarat is now one of the most active and the growing parts of Gujarat. So you can always use this to tweak it. So development can happen in very many different ways. Identify the soft entry spots. What is the soft entry spot? Enter it at that time, build social capital, harness it, let people participate, let them start celebrating it, let them start owning it, then you are likely to succeed than fail. This is the third thing. Coming to the point that you were making in terms of uh, what are we doing in terms of uh, building capability of uh, the civil service, before I go there, I would like to 
because I know there are large number of colleagues who will go and uh, start participating in the, in the consulting world. All of you will have an opportunity of contributing to policy formulation, research, giving some inputs, etc., etc. It's very important that we need an ethic, and I'd you know, request the ISB, Professor Chatre, etc. I think our profession needs an ethic. What is the public policy ethic that we have when we prescribe solutions? Are we neutral to the consequences? Are we engaged with the impacts? If somewhere we have a distance technocratic approach to it, we will never be engaged in the manner that we as policy professionals will be. I think each and every one of us should feel, of course, the pride of our success, but we should also anticipate the pain of our failures. So somewhere I think we need to look at it. So having said that, in the Lal Badu Shastri Academy, we started implementing the Mission Karma Yogi in terms of its templates. The Mission Karma Yogi, uh, whose design I had an opportunity of, uh, of contributing to, is, was designed very differently. I'll just talk about our two or three of the principles of design because we were dealing with the entire geography of the country. We were dealing with the entire federal structure of the country. We were looking at the entire non-linear nature of the civil service and at the fact that the civil service is interacting with the citizen on a minute-to-minute -minute basis where the citizen is experiencing the, the whatever the, the pain or, or the pleasure of interacting with the civil service in terms of the delivery of public service. So how do you simultaneously create capacity? Can you pull out people, give capacity and go by, send them back? Can you do it in different ways? What we traditionally did no longer works. So we designed it around three, four principles. Number one, we said let's democratize learning. Let's make learning as flat and accessible as possible. How do you make that happen? We said, okay, let's harness digital technologies. So a digital platform available to everybody to then consume information. Now, what do you consume? So then is the second element, which is something called FRAC, which is what is the role that you are discharging at that point, and what is the capability you, know to, you need to know to discharge it well. So that framework is called FRAC, framework of roles, abilities, and competencies. So this was mapped to the entire uh, structure of information that is getting delivered to the digital platform. Again, in a very democratic manner. Why democratic will come? Third, how do you make sure that you ha handle this vast canvas, the geography? So the third principle was give access to, to learners on a any time, any place, any device principle. So you have solved the problem of having to bring potential learner civil servant from his place of work to the place of trading. And that entire problem, in the past, before Mission Karma Yogi, I think I will not be wrong in, in stating the number. We were not doing, in the whole of the country, whole of the government bureaucracy, the civil service ecosystem, the total number of trainings that were happening were 15,000. Today, the learner ecosystem is 20 million. That is the challenge. So how do you do this transect? So the transect were by, 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 by these design principles. Make it accessible, make it flat, make it absolutely frictionless, and make it relevant and contextual. And finally, information is bite-sized. Three minutes, five minutes, so say jada nahi. Don't ask people to consume busy professionals lecture, who has time to sit? <laughs> but tell them, okay, you have to do this thing. This is the rule, how will you apply this rule? What are they, as you were saying, Justice B. Jeevan Reddy Sapka, I was a part of the Unikrishnan uh, litigation from the Gujarat side, incidentally. So how will you apply Unikrishnan? I mean, there are 2,500 pages. I want to know, okay, pre capitation principle, how do you apply it in a medical institution or a non-medical institution? That's how it started, MR, PI, and all that. So these are the bite-sized information. So in, in, uh, in, in the academy, now we are creating the templates. What we are doing is very interesting, and I hope that we'll all be able to participate in all of that. The Lal Badu Shastri Academy, as you know, started in 1959. We have 31,000 alumni. 
all of us are alumni. We have focused on 10,000 of them. Today, my target group is 10,000 only. I am now trying to build capacity for 10,000, out of which 7,000 are the central services, who have done their previous foundation course, etc., etc., who were earlier not coming back. But now we have started bringing them back so that we again top up, we start giving them appropriate, relevant information, and then we start building this common national kind of a consensus, administrative consensus. What is it that we need to do? The second, the whole of the IAS is a part of our ecosystem. But even in that, while we are doing everything, and since uh, Navikaji mentioned, what are we doing for the 10 year plus? We have now adopted a new policy. It's an interactive program, it's not a policy, but it's more a program where we have taken up around 1,100 learners, no matter whether they are in the academy or working in the field as a collector, as a commissioner, as a municipal commissioner, as a CEO, as a, as a part of our entire learning ecosystem. So what we start doing is we are now giving them digital and other content, including two-day, three-day type of touch points, that before they come to what is known as a phase three, Phase three is a very important touch point where we start specializing. So the phase three and the pre-phase three, we have around 1,700 learners, out of which I'm focusing on 1,100. And the 1,100 are being given specific types of specialized inputs. Now they are signaling on the basis of what they're consuming. This is again a Mission Karma Yogi thing, that the data emit will speak. What does it speak? If let us say out of 1100, 200 of them are interested in energy, energy sector and they are consuming energy. They're, they know that these are the courses they are, so I know that they are interested in energy. Somebody is interested in education. Somebody is interested in agriculture. Somebody else is interested in maybe infrastructure. So they have signaled to the system that the, out of this learner base of 1000, this is the percentage of specialization interest that has been already signaled. So today, even as I speak, I have, a, I have 178 officers who are currently undergoing with 10 to 12 years of seniority in the academy. We have redesigned the program. So we have one week of a common induction type of a thing where they get all the general information. Two weeks of specialized inputs. Each one chooses a stream. There's an energy stream, there's a digital governance stream, there's a health stream, there's a, there is an education stream, there's an agriculture stream. And after the two weeks specialization, the fourth week is then you bring them back all into a kind of a format where everyone is also getting to know generally what is going on in the other sectors. This is the need of the hour. Because while we are generalists, and what is a generalist? I believe a generalist is a specialist of, every, of, a, of a specific context. Generalist is not irrelevant to a, all contexts. It's just that in that particular context, he is also a specialist. He brings a lot of things there. So therefore, and I was just sharing with uh, some of my colleagues, I should tell you this. So in the last two weeks, for 178 officers under training in the LBS, we have had 200 guest speakers come from all over the country. It's higher than a Harvard ratio, one on one. For every learner, there's one professor. So these are some of the things we are doing. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Krishnivas. Uh, really insightful and uh, pleasure to hear all of you. I think our audience is also waiting for questions. I have more questions, but I'll go to them first. Uh, yes, we have a hand at the end. Can someone help with the mic? Uh, maybe you can ask. I think we will be will be able to hear. Yeah.
Okay. How do you deal with unintended consequences? Uh, who would like to <laughs> take this? Yeah, please. <laughs> In fact, uh, I would say try and anticipate as many consequences as possible. We will obviously go wrong somewhere. Uh, then we should be humble enough to change. Be flexible. We should be ready, adaptable, nimble, and keep your interventions very small. The biggest thing about policy design is fail early, fail small. Build on your successes one by one. If you have failed something, let that beca become a, a, an intervention to correct it, and then build on it. So we will eventually succeed. You might have some early failures. Don't be dissuaded or, or you know, discouraged by that. Thank you. Maybe we can. Yeah, you know, and then not much to add, I think. Uh, so uh, as he also said in his uh, you know, main address, planning is extremely important. Thinking through the whole policy, how it will work, uh, what can go wrong. The risk analysis of a policy is something that all of you do. But many government uh, programs and policy projects, uh, the risk analysis of the kind, uh, the rigor that we do, that's expected sometimes is not done, which is why it happens. But as he said, somewhere if you spend three years in planning and three years is required for implementation, you might do it faster. I think, as they say, Japanese spend a lot more time in planning and do it quickly. Uh, we don't spend much time in planning. Try to do it faster and we fail. I think that's the short point uh, I would like to mention. Thank you. One little thing, I think unintended consequences. I think you put it very well. The biggest failure, according to me, is at the time of drawing up your public policy, rather than going by evidence, trying to align with the views that have been given to you. I think unintended, in, uh, you know, unintended consequences are best avoided when those whom you are designing policy for, you are upfront telling them that, look, if you do this, this is what is going to happen. If you do this, this is what will happen, based on evidence. So somewhere or the other, I think that's an important point. Public policy is not a culture of conformism tool. It cannot be. Everybody says yes to a proposal. That's not how public policy is to be done. And I think unintended consequences happen because we often do it like that. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have a lady here. Yeah. Hi. Um, uh, my name is Sugant. Uh, I'm from I am Indore. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for such insightful uh, you know, stories that you have talked about in terms of policy making within the government. Uh, my question is, um, you know, these days uh, they say, you know, you can't go into a government uh, office and not run, run into a consultant. So the role of consultants and the think tanks has been uh, increasing. So I have two questions. First, what is driving this change? Like what has changed? And second, how do you see this role evolving considering we have so many, you know, think tanks coming up, government advisory coming up, so many policy graduates that are coming out. So how do you see uh, this space evolving. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> As sir is like, okay. I, in fact, uh, there's been a re recent article written by Yamini Iyer. I think it contextualizes it very beautifully. Very right in saying that all of us, huh, that if you have a consultant-driven government, then the government will have less incentive to build capacity. And finally, a, a incapable case, a state cannot have a capable consultant. And also, it, it brings, breaks that social contract between people and the governance that we are ultimately electing somebody to deliver, right? So we should not break that as a citizen and as a, as a, as a democracy. We should all, no matter whatever role and hat we are wearing. So this is the first. In fact, when I was mentioning to Professor Chatre and Arushi ji, I was going back, I studied public policy a decade back in Duke, and then I was remembering, it. maybe I'll take a half a minute to read. There were three definitions. Are you still reading that Weimar and Weining? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so Weimar Weining talks about three types of consultants. Okay. Right? So one is objective, te objective technicians. That's okay. Unintended. 
So he talks about an objective technician who takes this uh, kind of a very technocratic type of an ap uh, approach, who thinks that his, his analysis is everything. The client and the citizen are necessary evils. They're just in the way of that analysis. If it had worked out, analysis will work per perfectly. And therefore, his engagement with the consequences is much lesser. This is the first lot. The second would be the client's advocate. Essentially, because he feels, this consultant, that the client is giving me so much legitimacy that I that should somehow justify the ends and the causes and means or whatever. So in a way, you are subordinating your intellect or whatever to that kind of a, I would say, perverse relationship. This is the second dimension. The third is what, again, Weimar says is an issue advocate. So this guy wants to pursue his own personal policy agenda. He is looking who, which is the right environment in which I can put it. So I feel as a policy profession, we should guard against all three. We should have a very ethical, moral approach to it. Ultimately, no matter where we are working, whether in government, it's associated with government, advising government, think tanks, and they're very important because uh, in a way, government today is working at around 45% of its staffing capacity. So the consultant is actually coming in to plug that gap and is coming and plugging that gap at a space where some of the civil service leadership does not have time to, do, to maybe crunch numbers or maybe generate some reports, maybe do some other kind of activity. In a way, the consultant is a very, very important supplementary role. And it's a very, very important, I think, uh, symbiotic role. So I really look uh, at all consulting you know, kind of uh, frameworks in a very positive sense. And it is necessary in a way also it brings in a bit of, you can say, efficiency because the cost of government doing the same thing at that level might be slightly higher. So it's also an efficiency argument. So this is my take on it. Thank you, Mr. Srinivas. I think uh, we are all over time. Uh, I'll take one question. <laughs> okay, we have two, but I'll ask, uh, I'll request my uh, experts here to just stick to one minute of answers. Yeah, we go to the lady first. Later <laughs> on. <laughs> Uh, so, hi, panelist. Uh, thank you so much for an informative session. Um, my question is to the entire panel. Uh, so, it's about collaborating spirit in policy implementation. Um, I think working at the field when I was a consultant to the Chief Minister's program, I saw that um, we required a lot of collaboration spirit to be built among departments at the state and then at the district. What is your take on it, especially, I mean, giving like one anecdote, uh, let's say Anemia Mukbharat, how has, how have we achieved the goals and could the achieve, achieving goals could have been different if we would have collaborative, collaborated differently or how can we do it better? Mr. Sinha, Mr. Sinha would like to answer this. No, I think uh, very important issue you're raising. You know, this loosely hanging consultant is not effective. You need viewpoints and perspectives of people who are outside government. How do you institutionalize that learning? That's a challenge, as I understand. And it works at all levels. At the national level, many a time, you know, an arrangement which we became very comfortable with, we want to do something on IT. A lot of new developments are happening every day. Surely Kiran Karnik and the IIT Khadakpur director and others know much more than any of us. Can we have an advisory group where people like him actually advise a program? So we came up with this idea of the advisory group because a loosely floating consultant doesn't have that impact. It's not impactful. Whereas if you put them in a framework of institutions, then you get a different result. At the cutting edge, on the other hand, when you're talking about working at a block level as a professional, because again, something which in rural areas we need in plenty is good professionals. You know, educated from good institutions who are willing to give time to work on a program of livelihoods or whatever. There perhaps, the skill sets of the pro professional or the consultant matters a lot. Are you bringing is those skill sets which are ordinarily not available in government? Because we have more magistrates than managers. How do we reverse that equation? We need managers, but can we have them in an institutionalized structure is the real challenge. Thank you. Thank you. 
the last question uh, and maybe to his but colleagues. That will help others also to understand. The public policy is also scrutinized by parliament committees and risk analysis is also done by the CAG. How much this plays a role in, in improving the public policy one? And consultant, I would certainly say that somebody has very written in lighter word, ki minimum government and maximum government means permanent consultant and temporary employees. I leave it to you to decide. Thank you, Mr. Tripathi. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you so much to our esteemed panel who are here with us today. Uh, thank you so much for the insightful thoughts, for the discussions, and it's a pleasure uh, to have all of you here at ISB. So on behalf of everyone at ISB, thanks once again. Thank you once again, all the audience here. We'll continue with our sessions. <laughs>